A whole bunch of fascinating new magic cards just got spoiled for the upcoming Dungeons & Dragons Commander deck. Specifically, there is a range of cards focused on rolling dice. However, amongst them, there is one glaring absence. Magic. I am a wizard. History. I'm an old wizard. The magic historian. My bones hurt. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. My friends, we are here today to talk about the diciest of the new commander cards, specifically a set of cards focused around the concept of rolling dice. Now, Wizards has done something interesting in that they're using a bunch of different Dungeons and Dragon die options for these cards. However, there is a noticeable absence that genuinely left me scratching my head. So we will go through all the cards that are available and then I'll talk about what's missing because it's easier to show what's missing when we've already shown what's available. We're going to be starting out with a figurine of wondrous power, the Ebony Fly. This is one of those cards where if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, it becomes a lot more exciting as a card and a little more easy to understand. So the Ebony Fly is a two casting cost artifact. It enters the battlefield tapped. It taps for a colorless mana. So it's a two casting cost mana rock, which is already off to a good start because when it comes to mana rocks we have a lot of them in the three category in terms of casting cost and so competition is very fierce in the two cost slot there's not as much competition and obviously it's a little faster to speed up your deck as well now the fact you can't use it right away eh, i mean that's to offset it now the real ability i mean the additional ability depending on how you look at it is pay four mana roll a d6 so this is our d6 card and d a d6 rolling is something that's been a part of magic for a while in the unsets and whatever it doesn't feel that different it's the really like corner case like d12 d4 those are the more interesting concepts in terms of random dice includes but anyways this is four mana roll a d6 until the end of turn you may have ebony fly become an xx insect artifact creature with flying where x is the result and whenever ebony fly attacks another target attacking creature gains flying until end of turn so the idea behind this is as i mentioned this is a figurine of wondrous power i've always thought these were very cool dungeons and dragons items so this basically has some adventurer who owns the ebony fly and this is in the moment of activation because normally there'll be little inert statues and you can activate them and they will become living beings you could have a tiny little horse statue that turns into a war horse you can ride around in this case it turns into a giant massive fly that you can actually ride as a steed if you so desire you have a random range of size on it which makes this ability very interesting right you could end up with a 1-1 one, one flyer which is pretty underwhelming and you might actually wonder how is this even able to carry anybody but you could end up with a 6-6 six, six flyer which isn't too shabby for something that you put out that easily like it only costs two mana to put out so i i will say that this with the dungeons and dragons set it definitely feels like there's a lot of random variants that can really like magic is already a variant style random based game right we're not talking about chess where you have set pieces with set moves you know what you're going to get access to and you have all the information magic's very random in terms of will you have access to enough lands what are you going to draw off the top of your deck you don't know what your opponent has all these different random factors but the dungeons and dragons set feels like it's more random than a lot of regular magic sets and it actually kind of trends in some ways more towards an unset overall but either way this is a really cool concept the figurines of wondrous power have always felt like a great item in dungeons and dragons to me because they don't feel overpowered in most cases most cases they feel like okay this is good but it's not like a broken okay now i'm op style item and i feel like this does a good job of encapsulating that where you're like okay i see the potential of it it's not too shabby i mean if you don't know what a figurine of wondrous power is you'd just be like what what's even going on he's just got a little fly who would even want that but it looks all mystical look at the tendrils of magic coming up off of it so this is the d6 card we're gonna have a different card for each type of die 
Underdark Rift. Now this is a very potent card. This is a real, to me, this is a really interesting and potentially very strong card, but it does cost a lot to use as well. So this is the Underdark Rift. This is a land that taps for a colorless. Five and tap it, exile Underdark Rift, roll a d10, put target artifact, creature, or planeswalker into its owner's library just beneath the top X cards of that library, where X is the result activate only as a sorcery. So this is a one-shot answer. And the, the question is, how well does it answer the situation that you're dealing with? It's pretty versatile in the fact that it can target an artifact creature or planeswalker. So we can get, those tend to be big threats. You can't handle enchantments, but I mean, what are you gonna do? Obviously, there's only a certain level they wanna give in terms of power. And five to use this, is a steep cost. I'm not I'm not like saying this is the absolute most busted kind of card, but it has the potential to really hamper the opponent. It also has the attention the potential to not do that much, right? Because you're rolling a D10. So you could be making something disappear until like a turn away, basically. Like it's always going to go at least one under the top card of the deck. So it's not going to be the next card, but really at most you're going to buy yourself one turn if you roll a one. But if you roll a 10, all of a sudden, unless they have a way to dig through their deck, you've taken something and made it pretty much out of reach, especially in standard. If you have to wait 10 turns to get another card, the game's probably over. You're never going to make it to that point. Or if you do, then it was irrelevant that you lost the card in the first place because you have a high level of survivability or your opponent doesn't have a high level of ability to take you down. But the fact is, this is a colorless source that can go into any deck and handle artifact creatures or planeswalkers. So there is a lot of versatility here, but the D10 does add a crazy amount of variance. You can see why I said that I feel like the power level of the Dungeons Dragons set is like based on a lot more random variants and things could be wow or oh okay right it's not they're not as reliable in some cases but they have the potential for a much bigger upshot which is going to make some people happy and other people are going to be frustrated by the variants but for me this card seems like it has a massive amount of potential. And in a format like Commander specifically, it definitely feels like you're not gonna have too hard a time getting up to the five mana and then being able to get rid of whatever the biggest problem on the board is, getting around any kind of protection from colors or whatever. There's not a lot of creatures that are protected from colorless land sources, unless they have obviously something like Hexproof. But this is a funky card, and it basically depicts somebody falling through the Underdark. And I guess maybe the idea is how long it's gone is how far you fall, and then maybe you get buried under some rubble or caught up by underworld denizens. There's any number of things that could cause a delay, but this is a genuinely potent card in my opinion. Time will tell, obviously, due to the random nature and the five mana activation, but it's a very strong card to me. So the next card we're gonna talk about is the D20 card, and that is Dance Macabre. It's, a, oh, it's like a Lady Gaga song. Two black and three for a sorcery. Each player sacrifices a non-token creature, Roll a d20 and add the toughness of the creature you sacrifice this way. When I read this at first, I thought everybody rolled a d20, but it's just you. You roll a d20, add the toughness of the creature you sacked. If the result is 1 to 14, return a creature card put into a graveyard this way to the battlefield under your control. So you can either get your creature back or one of your opponent's creatures. And if the total's 15 plus, return up to two creature cards put into graveyards this way to the battlefield under your control. So this is an interesting card. I mean, it's going to cost each of your opponents a creature. At the bare minimum, it's not going to cost you a creature because you can return your creature or you can take something better from what your opponents got rid of. And Commander does have a lot of juicy, crazy, beefy creatures, right? So in this scenario, you can see, like, I don't know what the casting cost, if this is really honestly high level goodness because i'll admit i don't have enough experience with commander to 100 percent hone in on what's amazing or not but i feel like five mana to basically wipe out if you're playing a four player game you're wiping out three creatures with it and potentially reaping the benefits of getting the best two creatures out of that pile so it definitely feels like it has some genuine potential to at the very least 
be kind of annoying. And I like the artwork showing the crazy warlock in the background with the devil horns curling up. Like in the front, you have the regular skeletons. We see that kind of stuff all the time. But the warlock in the background who has been reanimated is a little more intense looking to me, especially with that like one glowing eye that's just staring directly at you. Sure, the skeletons are closer and ah, but it's, just, I don't know. There's just something about the warlock and the triumphant look. There's just this like almost serene look of pleasure on the uh, the sorcerer who's casting this reanimation spell's face. So I like this artwork. It's pretty sweet. So that's the D20 card. The next one we have to look at is Reckless Endeavor. So this is our D12 card, and you're actually gonna be rolling two D12s with this one. So this is two red and five for a sorcery. Roll two D12 and choose one result. Reckless Endeavor deals damage equal to that result to each creature, then create a number of treasure tokens equal to the other result. So basically the idea is roll two 12-siders, choose one of the numbers that you want to be the amount of damage that's done to every creature, choose the other number that you want to be the amount of treasure that you get. The flavor text says, which burns more fiercely, your ambition or the flame? That's actually a really cool bit of flavor text, right? Because you get to decide what burns more fiercely. Is it your ambition, where you want a bunch of treasure for more power, or is it the flame, which is, whoa, dude, I never noticed when I looked at this card before. There is a dude being incinerated in that dragon breath. The idea of dragon fire laying waste to everybody and getting a pile of treasure is totally conveyed pretty well in this artwork. You can see this little halfling thief is stealing away with a massive bag of gold coins and a chest. Like, that's a lot of physical strength required to carry that much weight. I remember encumbrance rules for Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know if they've changed at all, but uh, I don't think you'd be able to move that quick hauling that much coinage and gems. But either way, this is a cool card. Raid, basically recklessly raid a powerful dragon's lair and steal its treasure. So you steal the treasure and the dragon is, I guess, just blames everybody for it or throws a massive tantrum about losing its treasure and just goes about the battlefield setting every living being on fire. Burn! That's awesome. This really has the potential to be insane. It could be a 12 point damage across the board board wipe. You could get 12 treasure. I like the fact that you get to pick between the two depending on what's more desirable to you at any given moment. But I do have to fully acknowledge that the casting cost on this spell is massive. You could literally spend seven mana, roll two once. So you could spend seven mana to do one damage to every creature and to get one treasure token. So that is definitely going to be, I mean, these kind of cards fit better when you have things that let you kind of manipulate results or, you know, kind of nudge things the way that you want them to go. But to me, this really does feel reckless in a way. You're spending a ton of mana and what you're gonna get out of it isn't guaranteed, which makes it hard to plan with to a degree, right? But ultimately from a flavor aspect, this is a really cool concept, right? You don't know exactly how much damage a dragon a dragon's gonna be able to do in terms of breathing its fire out. You don't know exactly how much treasure you're gonna be able to steal from the dragon in the limited amount of time that you have. So that's reflected in the nature of the random die rolling and I dig that. So the next card we have to talk about is the D4 roller. Now D4s are the weirdest dice in Dungeons and Dragons. They're the ones that look like little pyramids and it feels very odd rolling a D4. Every other die that you roll feels somewhat natural. A D4, I don't know, man, it feels more like you're chucking it or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't have the natural flow of rolling properly and the way the numbers show up on the dice feels weird too because all the other dice have just one number per face but a D4 will have three numbers per face. It's a very weird way to randomize one to four, but what are you gonna do? There's no, there's no real other solution to create a D4 dice. Nobody's really come up with a different concept for it. So anyways, Bucknerd's Everfull Purse. This is an interesting item from Dungeons and Dragons. It's a two casting cost artifact, pay one and tap it, roll a D4 and create a number of treasure tokens equal to the result. The player to your right gains control of Bucknerd's Everfull Purse. 
As long as it's never left empty, this magic pouch produces coins every dawn. That is literally how this item works in D&D. It's a money pouch where as long as you leave some money in it, it will make more money. It's almost like it's a mini bank where it generates interest. Like, I've generated interest, but at a pretty phenomenal rate compared to the amount of money you have to have in it. However, Buckner's Everful Purse doesn't generate a lot of money. It will make you money every day but only a little bit. Not like, if you're somebody who needs to buy really expensive magical equipment, forget it, this isn't gonna help you. But if you were, let's say, living in a farming village or something like that, and you had that person kept it a secret, you'd be, you'd be rich, you know what I mean? It may only generate like a gold or two here or there, but depending on where you live, that would be a fortune. But as an adventurer, I've had this item, and ultimately it felt a little bit underwhelming. And the artwork shows it like filled to the brim, and that's definitely not how it felt. I don't know if they've updated it. I was playing in second edition, but ultimately, I it, they call it ever full purse, and it should have be like Buckner's kind of got a bit in it purse. That's how it felt. But I guess with the artwork, they want to make it look, whoa, look at all the treasure it makes. This is a weird card. I mean, this is like from a, from a magic standpoint, you're rolling a D4, creating treasure tokens, and then you've got to hand the purse off to somebody else. Why? Why do I have to give it to somebody else? I mean, I guess it's good if you're playing a deck based on your opponent having your permanence. Sure. But to me, not a big fan. Not a big fan of this card from a magic standpoint, but I think it's cool that they included it in the game. And obviously, if you made the dice rolling higher, check it out for one man, I could get up to 20, 20 treasures. It'd be too strong. So, that's all the dice rolling cards that we have. Now, you may have noticed one of the dice is missing. Where's the 8-sider? Why is a D8 left out? Is it going to show up in another commander deck? Or are they literally just going to, like, set me off with missing dice OCD? Where I'm like, where's the D8, bro? Where's the D8? They're going to have to commit me to an asylum. The D8! The D8! And it's like, does he want a V8? No, he doesn't want vegetable juice! All right, that was, that was a terrible joke. That's my cue to leave. All right, let me know your thoughts, my friends. Big shout out to all my patrons. Thanks for supporting my channel. And I'll leave a link to uh, the playlist of all my Dungeons & Dragons spoiler videos here at the end for you. Thanks for coming by. See you next time.